this one was a particularly stark example of where trying to instill fear in people, trying to tell them that, you know, you have been controlled your entire life by big pharma, by science, and you should come back to nature. You should allow plants to heal you. People buy into it. People in their thousands buy into it. And that's one of the things that really annoys me. Roll another. Yeah. Hello and welcome to Trolling with Logic for November 20th, 2016. I'm your host, Nathan Dickey, and with me we have a pretty nice group of people here today for a roundtable. I'll start with introducing our regular panel and then go on to our two special guests for today. We've got Cal with us today because he slept in and missed his boat, so he was able to make it. How are you doing, Cal? I'm doing grand apart from being landlocked, so but yeah, everything's good. And Kitch, how are you doing? I'm doing fantastic. How's how's you? And uh, we have Jen with us. How are you, Jen? Not too bad. Been playing a few too many video games over the weekend, so pretty cabin fevered, but otherwise cool. Awesome. And Julia, how are you? Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, we have two special guests today with us. The first is Microbloganism. Our listeners probably know who he is from YouTube and his uh, science videos there, debunking various nutritional and other health-related quackery and pseudoscience. His videos are good. We all recommend it. How are you doing, Micro? I'm doing pretty good. I'm slightly hungover, but... And yeah, just to button, he's also been a long time fan of our show and he's called in a heap of time. So just want to thank him for all the support over the years he's given us. And finally, we have Jim the Evo, a.k.a. James Gurney. All of our listeners probably know him pretty well as well. He's the host with Miles Power on the League of Nerds. How are you doing, James? I'm all right. Yeah, not too bad at all. Thanks for having me. And our show today, the topic is, in general, cancer quackery and specifically claims about cancer cures. And we originally planned to do this show specifically on the topic of cannabis and what role cannabis may or may not play in curing or preventing or ameliorating cancer. But uh, we're going to probably use that as a launching point and then talk about cancer cures more generally. Does anybody want to start us off on this topic? Uh, we should probably talk about cancer itself first. And one thing to get out of the way in these kinds of discussions is to note that cancer's not just one ailment or one disease, is it? It's a variety of diseases. Yes, it's, um, it's cancer is just this broad term that's used for a variety of diseases, but they all have in similar is that a cell that was acquired a multiple hits of mutations which cause it to, it to lose the ability to uh, regulate its cell division so it divides uncontrollably into a mass of pretty much useless cells it just basically breaks you down and does jim or kitsch or micro or any of our experts in this area or relatively speaking, experts compared to the rest of us, can anybody give like an estimate of how many types of cancers there are? I know there's a lot. Uh, the number I always tend to say is around 200. That, I mean, that's it's possibly on the low end because the, 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 the weird thing about cancer, or well, possibly interesting depending on how you look at it, is you also have uh, an example I normally give is if, if two of us have skin cancer, say I have a twin and we both have skin cancer, the way my skin skin cancer may have developed, the genetic mutations that happened could be completely different from my twins, and still both of us would, would be said to have skin cancer. So this is a topic that's, when, when talking about cancer, it's a lot more complex than a lot of the practitioners of alternative medicine would have you believe when they're, <laughs> when they're selling you their, their easy cures that they say are designed to battle big pharma. Uh, they hold up Big Pharma as this expensive, evil corporation that just wants to make a profit. But at the same time, they're charging quite a pocketful of money for, um, from vulnerable people. A lot of people seem to look past that aspect of it is the expensiveness of 
alternative cancer cures. I like to call this the, the Bozinski uh, defense. His and his clinic claim that their treatment of uh, unproven cancer treatments wouldn't be picked up by the pharmaceutical company because they're not, they're not, they can't make enough money of it when him and his clinic are able to make more than enough money off it and not have the advantages of massive scale up and all the other things that have you can get from having a huge company. Yeah, they have enough money to hire good lawyers. So Lawyers are how, more expensive than postdocs, that's for sure. How profitable would a cancer cure be? I imagine it'd be pretty profitable. The narrative that doctors and corporations that sell pharmaceuticals don't want a cure to be known because cancer is lucrative to them falls apart when you talk to economists, for example, and they come up with models for how seriously profitable a cure for cancer would really be. Well, if you mean a, a catch-all term for all cancers, which would be very unlikely, almost I'd, I'd, almost rate or impossible to for one thing to cure all cancers. But I just based up absolutely no real understanding of uh, of economics. I'm after all only a biotech expert here. Um, I imagine though that there would be some there'd be some substantial profit to be made because yeah, if you have that, you can patent that cure. And basically, cancer is one of these things that if you live long enough, you will get cancer. Basically, it's not a question of whether you'll get cancer or not. It's a question of when you'll get cancer. Yeah, pretty much. A similar problem comes with vaccines. People you know, can say vaccines are one a lifetime treatment. When How do the pharmaceutical companies make their money on vaccines if it's not profitable to have a single quote cure at one point if 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 there was a thing similar thing for cancer it would be mind-bogglingly successful and make them trillions of dollars if not more and also yeah, it means and... that people don't have to people don't really have to look after themselves as much as they usually would do if you produce a cure-all or something that is close to a cure of a particular illness or an area of illnesses then you produce something that people can take when they are doing things to excess so they can they can live lives to the max, they can eat whatever they want, they can do whatever they want, they can live inside a nuclear reactor, and at the end of the day, they just take one pill and they're fine again. So, yeah, it would be incredibly, incredibly successful. Even for the smoking industry, that would be pretty much them back on back on top of the cure for cancer. Now, speaking of a different kind of smoking, we want to kick off our discussion of the various cancer cures that are out there with a discussion of marijuana and cannabis and cannabinoids, whatever you prefer. There's been a surge of interest in both the general public and among some scientists and organizations in exploring the possible curative or preventative effects of smoking cannabinoids, but there doesn't seem to be a lot of promise, and so it's low on the priority of studies that scientists and organizations are looking at. There are only two compounds in the whole marijuana plant that actually produce all the psychoactive effects of marijuana. There's delta-9 THC and delta-8 THC, and that's it. Yeah, yeah, I think you're right there, yeah. But there's, uh, you know, at least 90 separate bioactive molecules in typical run-of-the-mill cannabis as well. I've noticed a really big surge. Again, this is with social media. I've noticed a huge trend recently. You know, everyone's got the friends that are sharing, oh, the, the doctors are suppressing cannabis as a cancer cure because they would it would put them out of business or they wouldn't get a business out of it anymore. Is there any science at all to cannabis as a treatment for cancer in any way? There's a 1975 study by the University of Virginia, and researchers there found that cancerous growth in the lungs of mice was slowed by orally administrating those two compounds that I mentioned, Delta-9 and Delta-8 THC. There wasn't much of an effect. The study didn't prove that marijuana stops tumor growth in humans. There was a slight effect in the mice. But in the 40 plus years since that paper, there has been no demonstrative conclusion to establish that. Is there any mechanism even proposed by these uh, people who are promoting the idea that these compounds can cure cancer? Like, is there any interaction with any cancer cells? What kind of interaction is there? There's a inhibition from CB2 to the ERK pathway. So how much biochemistry do you want me to try and do here? Uh, ERK pathway is involved in a whole bunch of like cell signaling and cell mitosis stuff. So inhibition of that 
you could lay out and say there is a, a potential rationale here that activation of the CB2 from cannabinoids might downregulate migration and inhibit mes- metastasism. Yeah, but is is that what the Wu people are claiming? Because I don't. Oh God! No. Yeah, exactly. Because usually when <laughs> you read, um, like when you go on some crack website and read, oh, cannabis cures this and that and cancer and everything, they don't really give that much of a mechanism it's basically just no look we say this therefore it's true it uh, appeals to um, nature a lot of the time as well yeah it's basically like a modern form of herbalism to some extent and just on on the issue of the social media it's one of the more disappointing things i i find because i'm a part of i'm I've liked a Facebook page about legalizing marijuana in, Ar- marijuana in Ireland because I'm for legalization of marijuana. But it's just disappointing to see that this website is who, trying to get something that I would like to happen, sharing these just awful, awfully bad pseudoscientific memes. I mean, it's needless, really. Is anybody familiar with the person with whom this whole uh, marijuana cures cancer movement started his name is rick simpson and he's been passionately and very heavily promoting marijuana as a cure for cancer since the 1970s no I've never heard no. Of no nope no his work is based almost entirely on personal experience and testimonials and anecdotes uh he heard a radio segment about marijuana being tested and studied by researchers. This was back in 1974. He tells about driving through Nova Scotia and hearing it on the radio. A few days later, he was working in a boiler room and sustained a head injury. And for years after that, he had headaches, uh, trouble sleeping, and a little bit of arthritis, I think, which was caused by something else. He decided to grow his own marijuana and self-treat himself with it he created hemp oil from his plants and uh, used it as a lotion and claims that all of his symptoms disappeared almost overnight his doctor didn't believe him his doctor strongly suggested that he keep on taking what it was prescribed to him and rick simpson didn't understand why the doctor didn't believe him he didn't grasp the concept that you need to treat your claims as a hypothesis and try to falsify and disprove it he just looked for confirmatory signs and he's been going on on that vein ever since with his he's been touring through the uk holding seminars he wrote a book about cannabis curing cancer his story is a real case study or a case example of somebody who, through a combination of confirmation bias and wishful thinking, really self-deceives himself. And it's a real cautionary tale, I think. So is he basically another Wakefield then? Uh, no, he is not somebody I would put in the same category. He's very sincere about what he believes in, and he's not in it for the money unlike a lot of his other peers in the whole cancer cure movement. There's another guy who um, keeps coming up over and over again on Facebook and Twitter, and people keep sharing this story of a guy who cured himself with cannabis oil, or so he claims, um, without realizing that the guy actually died long before they've posted this of bowel cancer. Um, And his name is David Habit, uh, or Hibbit, sorry. Um, He was diagnosed in 2012. He was given 18 months to live. He lasted four years, but he claimed during that time that he'd lived longer because cannabis oil had cured him of his his bowel cancer. Yeah, that's ringing a bell with me, that. The male was one of the first ones to pick it up, I think, way back in when when he first claimed it. And there are pictures of him looking like death, basically. He looked like he was at death doors, holding up these two little vials of cannabis oil and saying, I've cured myself. Um, And it only cost me £50 a month. So, uh, fuck all these harmful, toxic uh, radiotherapy chemicals and chemo. I've been cured with this completely holistic method of cannabis oil. Uh, And then, yeah, he he died and the mail once again picked that up. At the very best, uh, marijuana, if used to treat cancer, would have to be used in combination with chemotherapy and other conventional uh, methods of treating cancer because... The state of the literature so far, from what I've read in my research, is that there are some preclinical models, and that's about it, models that study cannabis mostly in synthetic form, but even in purified form, they show relatively modest anti-tumor activity. 
And of course, another thing is that a lot of the time people say, okay, such and such is cured or destroyed cancer cells in a petri dish or destroyed cancer cells in rats. And then, then the people who are proponents of uh, cannabis as a treatment for cancer will pick that up and they'll run with it as cannabis has cured cancer in a certain way, whereas it's just happened in the lab. And it's not been lots of things cure in, in that inverted commas sense cancer in lab rats and in a petri dish, but that does not mean it's effective in humans. Bullets. Bleach. Exactly. You mean men- mineral miracle mineral supplement? I think you mean. <laughs> oh, but actually, Nathan, you brought up a good point um, in talking about the purified, because th- there is this idea that that the end product. Let's say we find out that cannabis actually can be used to cure cancer or some form of, ca- of cancers, um, that it would be smoking it. People f- seem to think that you would be using the actual plant rather than getting it in a purified form where you can control the dosage and yeah basically as an actual drug which kind of shows that people don't have don't really understand how pharmaceuticals are made or work this is where uh, rick simpson falls short too um when he was uh using hemp oil to treat his condition he did not utilize any quality control to determine the dosage uh, he didn't keep records, and he also didn't isolate the compounds that might have a medicinal effect. So in short, he did everything pretty much wrong. I really like what Kitch said, that people who want marijuana to be legal tend to promote this kind of thing. But so they, I think they probably would look at it as kind of, okay, marijuana is fun. If this is a cure, it would be fun. But getting high would be a terrible side effect of that as a medication. Yeah. And also another thing that people don't realize when they're trying to promote the use of cannabis as a as a decent drug, as a holistic drug, is that even though cannabis isn't as carcinogenic when smoked as tobacco smoke, for example, and therefore doesn't lead necessarily if smoked on its own to as high levels of lung cancer and that kind of thing, it is still carcinogenic when smoked. With vaporizers, not as much, but once again, there's new studies coming out recently about vaporizers and the oils, etc., used within them, uh, and the substitutes for certain types of things to actually get that into a vapor to get it into your lungs. That also being potentially harmful and causing respiratory illness, etc. So I think it's very important, even if you are a proponent of legalizing these sorts of things, to be very cautious about the delivery method and also encouraging people to minimize harm. Oh yeah, any kind of particles you get in your lungs are not going to be a good thing and that includes like an open fireplace there was a study just released this month that found that marijuana use weakens heart muscles as well Uh, this was a study from uh, st luke's university health network i mean with with any drug there are going to be side effects on the physiology what what you're doing when you take any drug is you're altering how your your basic biochemistry works and the past four billion years or so of evolution have made a pretty finely tuned machine and doing anything to it can cause problems. Mm, yeah. Are you aware of any cancer cure gurus types who are claiming that there's a way to treat cancer or whatever type of cancer you have without using drugs of any kind? Yeah, plenty. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I mean, I mean, aside from natural drugs, a lot of them will push natural drugs. Um, or conveniently selling them at a low, low cost. Mm-hmm. I mean, you have the example of the people who push um, the pH diet, where the idea is that you can cure cancer by making your blood or and well your body fluids more alkaline. Part of that comes from because cancer cells, the fluids around cancer cells tend to be more acidic because their metabolism function is a bit different than the other cells. So you end up going more an- anaerobic and end up with more acids. So that, but people have basically turned that idea on the, its head and said that the acid is what causes the cancer. Rather than the cancer cure causing the acidic environment. It's, that's the Warburg effect, isn't it? Yeah, that, that's what leads to um, the higher acidity. Yeah, that's where um, basically there's less oxygen in the cancer cell environment, or is it just burning through it's uh, sugar reserves by incompletely metabolizing that sugar to form organic acids like lactic acid. Yes, exactly. When you get uh, from glucose to pyruvate, instead of using that pyruvate for the um, was it the aerobic metabolism, it converts that into 
uh, was it lactic acid or lactate, and then excretes that. Yep. So that's so, why you get that environment. So basically, the cells are fermenting almost. Pretty much, yeah. And just on the pH, it's your blood is very good at keeping a neutral pH of seven point two because it's uh, buffered. You know, it's 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 going to respond to any change to the pH and bring it back to the regular pH. Well, and the pH level inside cancer cells is pretty much the same as the level in normal cells. Is that right? Yeah, it's just the environment around the cells. So because of the ex excretion, I think inside the cells, they keep it the same still. One claimed cure that I've seen banded around quite a lot, a lot which isn't just uh, cancer, but also they claim can cure diabetes, etc., is the raw food one. And I don't know whether that works on the same kind of principle as this uh, pH balancing one or if it is something different. But they promote the use of just raw vegetables and that kind of thing to cure various illnesses. I heard of that before, actually. Um, I heard that they claimed that cooking, the process of cooking food actually causes some sort of chemical reaction that creates poisons and toxins in food, which is, as far as I'm aware, complete horseshit. It's not, not 100%. It does produce certain molecules that are linked to causing cancer, but we're talking such minuscule levels here. It's the same like formaldehyde in an apple. No one gives a shit. It's not going to kill you. It's the same of cooking. The, the process of uh, burning meat does produce minuscule levels of chemicals, which taken a large enough amount would, would harm you, but not at the level you, you're going to eat from cooking. Oh, cool. Yeah, and, and it gets worse if you overcook it. So actually being good at cooking helps. <laughs> Another cure is uh, meditation, apparently. How would that work? Don't know. Our old friends uh, Deepak Chopra and those kind of people uh, promote this idea of, you know, if you think about it hard enough, if you put it into your higher conscious mind, the universe will give it to you. That kind of stuff. All it's right. like this, The Secret, that book, which I did not read, but heard of. Okay, on this subject, there's something I pre-prepared. I haven't told anyone about it, but I've got a list here of things the Daily Mail has either claimed cures or causes cancer. So I'm going to test all you guys to see what you think <laughs> well i'll jump in with these at random and at the end of the show i'll give you i'll tot up the scores so oh great hey <laughs> so, here we go this is who knew number, we had a concordance on the show yeah number one <laughs> is uh dogs jen do you think dogs either cause or cure cancer according to the daily mail depends how good they taste so what are you going for um probably gonna say cause cancer okay julia uh, prevent. Jim? Definitely cause. Nathan? I'm going to go with prevent because from what I've seen from the Daily Mail, they're pretty friendly towards this whole man's best friend, kind of communal, get together with uh, your animal friends kind of thing. It just strikes me that they would say prevent. Okay, catch. I'm going to say prevent for pretty much the same reasons. And Michael, what's your verdict? Uh, I'm going to say course, because it's the Daily Mail. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right, carry on with the discussion. Uh, I'll come back with a question in a little bit for you. I don't know if the Daily Mail's put it out, but they've, you know, they obviously have contradictory stories all the time, but the idea is that dogs can smell cancer and stuff like that, so maybe they may have said prevent as well at one stage. Oh, yeah, that's true. Oh, yeah, I forgot about that. You know, and the Daily Mail may be just as bad as Mike Adams' natural news website, because I suspect that I haven't looked into it as closely as I have with natural news, but with natural news, Adams' story changes from day to day with the articles he puts out. The Daily Mail probably, I suspect, puts out contradictory stories on a day-by-day -day basis as well. Probably within the same paper. Yes, sometimes mm -hmm. within the same paper, they've been caught doing that. I can understand more with the Daily Mail, where it's sort of a bunch of different editors and journalists but with mike adams i think the the one i remember last time was he was selling something to protect against the zika virus while also promoting that the zika virus didn't exist yeah nice he, he, there's, i think there's a picture out there of the article about the zika being a conspiracy and then there's a commercial an advert in the in the corner for the um, protecting thing yeah, and it was also, as someone found it one or two years ago, there was one day he was saying ADHD is, uh, doesn't exist, and then the next day they were selling a homeopathic cure for ADHD. Oh, I saw that, yeah. 
Yeah, and it was literally the day after one, the first one saying it doesn't exist, and then the next day he's promoting a cure for it. It is interesting how uh, these homeopathic cures can cure non-existing ailments, isn't it? It's a math question or a philosophy. How, what can a non-existent treatment cure? Everything and nothing at the same time. Was the disease also diluted? <laughs> Mayo Clinic. The Mayo Clinic have actually got some, um, they've got a page on alternative medicines for cancer, but they say at the top, of course, that these can't cure cancers, but they can m maybe help out. So, for example, for the anxiety of going through cancer, you can do hypnosis, massage, meditation and relaxation techniques. And then they have other treatments to consider trying if you're going through cancer treatments, such as uh, yoga, acupuncture, aromatherapy, uh, music therapy, tai chi. Just exercise. I think exercise is a good one, Bay. A lot of those sound like really expensive placebos. Indeed, yeah. Or, or just, yeah, exercise, uh, given, it's been given a fancy name. One thing I did want to say, what are the actual uh, medical benefits of cannabis? I've heard them mentioned here and there, but can you guys give us a breakdown of what they actually are? One I heard of is increased appetite, which, you know, the munchies. Yeah, but I seem to remember reading that doesn't actually really work that well. The idea is that you would give it to cancer pa patients because um, they have reduced appetite because of chemotherapy. It turns out that the mechanism by which the chemotherapy causes that dec decrease in appetite and the me mechanism by which the cannabis increases your appetite might not be the same. One of the possible things is the uh, pain relief from cannabis, which has probably more, more research on it than the, the, the preventative side of things. It, it does seem that cannabis and cannabinoids are able to reduce certain levels of pain. I think that one of the classic ones is prostate cancer leading to bone cancer. For complicated reasons, prostates and bone are very similar in a lot of ways. So a risk from prostate cancer is actually developing into bone cancer. Most men will die with prostate cancer of some form, they'll just outlive the, the cancer, but if it can metastasize to bone cancer, it becomes incredibly dangerous and painful. Yeah, because I think one of the original claims I heard around cannabis was that it, some MS patients have reported it actually helps them, it gives them some relief. I, I don't think it's surprising that cannabis would have a pain relieving effect, considering that stone people tend not to notice things as much. <laughs> That's true. This is true, yeah. And anecdotally, I have used it for tooth pain before, and it was great. <laughs> you could say that was because I was on, cannabi on cannabis or uh, it, it re reduced the pain, but uh, it made me not care about it so much for the night. And also, it make, there is, like, being stoned, you are more relaxed, or so I'm told. I've never done it. So, But, like, the, uh, a large part of pain is also the anxiety of it. That there is a pretty, fairly large psychological uh, aspect to pain. Another thing is if you smoke enough of it, you have a fantastic sleep and what happens when you sleep? You don't feel pain. So if you're passed out for most of the day, then that's a lot less pain. Isn't there a lot of psychiatric disorders, psychological disorders associated with marijuana? I think there are people with certain like predispositions that probably shouldn't use it where it could trigger some kind of psychological issue, but that might depend on what on your on the background of each particular person how it will affect them yeah i imagine it could be hard to determine causality right uh, whether the person suffering from some psychological disorder it's like schizophrenia or what have you was that way before he or she used cannabis or whether the cannabis sparked that disorder maybe i think they recommend if you have um schizophrenia or something like that in your family somewhere that you probably shouldn't use it. All right, guys, I'll go for the next one here. Uh, electricity. Jen. Uh, I'd say that was probably a cure. I don't know. They're quite keen on electroshock therapy for other things, so maybe. Julia. Electricity. What? I, uh, I got to think about that. Uh, think Tesla. <laughs> Both? <laughs> oh, goodness. Uh, cure. Jim, what do you say? Cause this cancer. Nathan? I gotta go with the cure. Kitch? My gut feeling is to say both because um, consistency and all that. But I'm gonna say cause because um, guessing the stories about uh, power lines. And micro? 
I'm gonna say cause too because this this sounds like as Kitch was saying, yeah, it sounds like EM fields or something like that. All right. Yeah, I guess so. That has been. I think that has been claimed at some point. Yeah, that definitely was. I do remember because I work in engineering. There was that claim that there was pockets of cancer patients around power lines. What about mobile phone masks? That seems to be one that's quite recurring as well. Yeah. Um, and the phone themselves. Oh, yeah, the mobile phones. Are fair. The one I heard was having, well, it's not on my list, but uh, using a laptop for men would cause testicular cancer because you've got it sitting on your lap, obviously. You're using it wrong. Yeah. <laughs> it's not, that's not what that slot's for. Oh, so that's what I've been doing wrong all these years. Don't plug your dongle in there. It begins. So uh, there's one thing like I see in the anti-cancer movement, and that is their hatred of chemotherapy, which they just say, oh, they're just poisoning you on purpose, which I find really bizarre because they keep saying, you know, they want to make money off you, but they're, they're just going to poison you at the same time, which is just a weird thing. But can you guys clear up what actually is chemotherapy and how effective it is? I can understand that they would look at it that way because chemotherapy is nasty. It's a blunt instrument. It pretty much targets, as far as I know, uh, rapidly growing cells. But there's a lot of cells in your body that, or there are certain cells that are in your body that do normally uh, multiply rapidly as part of its part of its normal function. Yeah, that's why you end up with uh, people end up losing their hair and getting intestinal problems because your hair and your hair follicles and your intestinal lining is one of some of the places that you have those fast dividing cells. Yeah, exactly. And chemotherapy doesn't distinguish between or discriminate between healthy and unhealthy cells, does it? Uh, no, it can't. There's, um, well, there's not really much difference, broadly speaking, between a cancer cell and a healthy cell that Apart from elevated markers on the, on the cell surface. Can I ask one question about this? Uh, there was a story about a kid, I don't know if you remember, I think it was last year, this young lad who was said to be on his last legs and the parents took him out of the country and took him over to, I can't remember where it was now, but to get proton beam therapy, which is apparently this more directed, but some say like not that much more effective therapy for for cancer does anyone know much about proton beam therapy or how that differs from normal uh, radiotherapy if i remember correctly it's, you can basically program is the wrong word but you can make it so that the, the protons don't doesn't release their energy until they're in a like in a certain depth um you can base so you can basically target the cancer without hurting the tissue between the gun the proton beam making gun thing. I'm not sure what it's called. And the cancer cell. That's, I think that's what it is. Another claim to cancer cure that I've come across, the photon genius being sold for 25 grand, not including shipping and handling, recommended by a certified Olympic chiropractor. It's a, branded as a detox treatment, which right off the bat, when you hear detox treatment, you know you're dealing with quackery. Yep. Oh, just to point out, the proton beam thing, that is an actual treatment. That's, that's not really that really crackery. It's just that it's very experimental at this point. And very expensive as well, yeah, which is why yeah. they Yeah, it's, it's, it's not done in the UK at the moment, as far as I'm aware. I think it costs £5,000 a pop, and it's done in a different country or something like that. Has anyone ever seen a uh, claim of Reiki curing cancer? Yes. <laughs> Sorry, what's that? I never heard of that before. You never heard of Reiki? It's basically non-contact energy transference. Basically, they, think massage without actually being massage. Yeah, yeah they just kind like, of hover, hover their hands over you. So they use the force. That's essentially basically, it, yeah. yeah. They might as well, yeah. Weird. We actually had somebody um, who uh, can't remember exactly how it came about, but he he was having conversations with us at Manchester Skeptics um, when there was some sort of a hoo ha a couple of years ago. And he's now a friend of mine, and and he actually joined up claiming that he was a Reiki master and caused this big stir, and it was hilarious. But yeah, you've got to read up on Reiki if you haven't seen it beforehand. It is like homeopathy, but then there isn't actually even a placebo pill. It just, you hover your hands over somebody else's body and you go, do you feel it? Do you feel it? Do you feel the energy? Are you cured yet? 
It's like homeopathy, but with less steps. Yeah. It's homeopathic, homeo, you know, homeopathy, you could look at it. Okay, I'm going to go to number three on my list here. So, uh, here we go. Masturbation. Jen, according to the Daily Mail, does it cure or prevent cancer? Oh, sorry, I was too busy masturbating to cure my cancer. Definitely a cure. Okay, Julia. Aren't they pretty, uh, what do you call it, Puritan? So I would think it probably causes cancer, according to them. Uh, Jim, what do you say? Does it depend on who, like male or female? Because it's kind of different. I'm, I'm going to say cure. Okay, Nathan? Yeah, I'm going to say cure as well. That sounds like something the Daily Mail would say. And Kitch? I've heard cure, so I'm going to go with cure. And Michael? I'm going to go with cure as well, because masturbation is healthy, so I wouldn't be surprised if they ran with that. Okay. Now, how do we get this back on the cancer after speaking about masturbation? I don't know. We were doing about chemotherapy a minute ago. The, the, the challenge that most of the things are poisonous is a fair way to say it in, in certain ways. And I, I'm, I'm surprised a lot more anti-cancer people don't come from the point of view that uh, some of the cancer cures were actually... The first real chemotherapy was actually a derivative of mustard gas. Well, those people oh. were cured, weren't they? I think I have seen a few places that actually made that connection, saying that, oh, it's, it's derived from mustard gas. Like, they're basically saying that the modern ones are too. It's the same argument as people use against Monsanto, isn't it? It's saying, well, they, they produced Agent Orange, therefore anything that they do that's genetically modified these days must be a result of that kind of study. They, they even go further sometimes. I've seen them say that uh, the harbour brush process was used to make explosives. Therefore, all modern farming that uses nitrogen-based fertilisers is somehow a war product? Do they think that the plants are going to explode? Oh, I wouldn't put it past <laughs> them, to be honest. Uh, one, thing, one question I had about chemotherapy is there's a lot banded about, and there is a, a little bit of evidence towards it that I've seen anyway. I don't know. I'm not an oncologist myself, so I don't really understand it in depth. But this idea that uh, chemotherapy and radi radiotherapy actually cause cancers themselves and therefore your your risk of having another cancer after having these treatments is actually vastly increased is that is that true to some extent yeah they are like is they are cytotoxic most chemotherapies are carcinogenic to some extent and being radiated yeah well radiation is is carcinogenic too so yeah there is some truth to that but um, you also go, once you've completed your course, you get more frequent checkups. So it balances out. I think the idea with that is that the cancer cells, they're kind of, they're broken. Normally when a cell is, is broken, quote unquote, they will have apoptosis. They will kill themselves and you won't be bothered by it. That I think the idea with um, the chemotherapies that are kind of carcinogenic is the same where they, they want to get those cells to break to the point where they will commit apoptosis. There's a little bit of a double standard with people who condemn chemotherapy as being poisonous, which it is, but specifically the people pushing amygdalin or lat latrial. I'm sure some of you have heard about that as a cancer cure. Yeah. Oh, because yeah. because latrile causes cyanide poisoning. That's basically what latrile is. It's considered dangerous by the medical establishment for that reason. It's it yeah, it's a cyanogen and the the claim is that somehow the um the amygdalin can distinguish between healthy cells and cancer cells and only release the cyanogen towards them, which is not how it works because it's broken down in cyanide as soon as it gets into your gut. That's where the breakdown happens. I was getting really mad about, sometimes they t call it vitamin, uh, what is it, B17, I think? Yeah. Which is so deceptive. That's not what a vitamin is. Yeah. A vitamin, um, just for the audience, a vitamin is, uh, is something you can't produce yourself, but that you need. It's a compound that you have to get from food. Or sunlight. There's a couple of other experimental treatments that I'm quite interested in, but I don't understand um, completely, such as fecal uh, microbiotica transplantation. And also there's another one which is about, I think they took white blood cells out of the body of a leukemia patient, transformed them somehow in the lab and then put them back in again so that they would be able to fight the leukemia. Do any of you guys know anything about those? I know the uh, they are 
researching a potential a way to make immune cells recognize the cancer cells as foreign so that they are able to fight them. I don't know about the fecal transplantation. I know it's a real thing, but I don't know about as a cancer cure. I think it's um, as a uh, an obesity kind of thing or bowel issue. I heard stats going on, uh, fecal transplantation. I heard there's research going on in APC here in Cork about that. But I haven't heard anything about cancer. I, I won't be surprised if some people are pushing that. I hear peop- some people are pushing probiotics as a cure or a treatment for cancer, but it's a lot of, as far as I can see, it's a load of crap. No pun intended, <laughs> just a happy accident. Thanks. All right, here's the second last one for you guys. I'll gonna see, I've got a big list. Here we go, housework, prevent or cure cancer according to the Daily Mail, Jen. Oh God, according to the Daily Mail, I have no idea. I think it is a fantastic thing to do but then I'm a bit sad. I'll go with cure again. I'm going for cure on each and every single one of these. All right, uh, Julia. Okay, I know this one is definitely prevents cancer. Jim? Uh, cure? Yeah, let's go for cure. Okay, and Nathan? Yeah, that sounds very homely of them. I'm going to say cure as well. Catch. Doing the housework, cures or prevents cancer? Sorry, uh, cures or causes cancer, sorry. So. I'm going to say cure. Sound, sounds like something they would say. And Michael? Yeah, yeah, cure, uh, cures or prevents. Okay. All right. For women, that is. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't think it's anything to do with science. It's just the sort of a chauvinistic opinion, probably. I mean, it could also be the other way around and, and basically appealing to people's laziness. I thought about that as well, too, for a second. Realistically, you could say household chemicals might have an impact there, but I don't think that's the direct they're taking. I mean, it's. Then I'm thinking it might be the, in exercise, like the fact that you're getting some degree of exercise uh, from doing the housework. I'm just trying to find a story online which I saw a few years ago, and I can't find it anywhere. I think it was based in Switzerland, a new treatment where they were they were replacing something in the body, and it was meant to be a non-destructive treatment. I can't remember what it is, and I know the word begins with an E, but it's one of those times that I can't remember what I'm thinking about. Any ideas? There is one thing that just came to mind, and it's a subject that keeps coming up, and uh, James, you'll have some experience with this, with the whole glyphosate thing, and it's this argument over... You know, when a study says probably carcinogenic, uh, what are they actually meaning when they publish these studies? Depends who you ask. Uh, the, what the IARC mean, the International Research Agency of Cancer, is there has been some preliminary evidence that suggests at some dose these things might cause cancer. That has, says nothing about the actual risk of these things causing cancer. Uh, for example, the glyphosate or bacon. Your increased risk of cancer from eating bacon, yeah, there's there's an increased risk, but day to day life, it's it's it doesn't really cause any problems. It, <laughs> everything could cause cancer. This is where the Daily Mail is kind of right. In 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 some way or some fashion, anything that interacts with your body could disrupt it to cause cancer. The real important thing should be what is the actual risk, like standing next to chernobyl's reactor for two minutes that will cause cancer well you probably die before you get cancer but there are there are certain things that the risk clearly is so high it's it's worth avoiding like smoking uh like sunbathing can cause skin cancers etc whereas ingesting uh acrylamide in cooked foods the risk is so small your actual you could say oh it's a 200 percent increase in risk but your risk of getting that cancer in the first place is one in a hundred thousand so your, your real risk of getting it is, what, three in 100,000 then? Yeah, this is something that's overlooked by a lot of people, is the difference between relative risk and absolute risk. People talk as if there's only absolute risk, and they're only thinking in terms of that. Yeah, it's sort of like you sit in the house, there's not much chance you're going to get hit by a car, but if you walk along the quiet country road, you've increased your risk, but not by a massive amount. That's kind of what you mean, James, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, because, well, the, the glyphosate's a really good one because the claim I always hear back is, well, cancer's going up all the time and we've only just had, you know, and they always go, GMOs just got introduced. Can you explain it? And they said, well, yeah, there are actually some good reasons for that. DMRI. It's not like, it's not like anything else has changed since then. 
you know, like the life, her life expectancies are going up and up. And I think it's also uh, det detection of early stage cancer just getting better. Yeah, the bigger the longevity rate, the life expectancy as it goes up, cancer rates go up with it. I found this now. Um, I think it's a Swiss pancreas center that does it. It's an enzyme therapy. I don't know anything about enzyme therapies at all, but I understand that they began being researched, I think, in the 80s. Can anyone shed any light? Does, that, does anyone know anything about sort of pancreatic cancer and enzyme therapy? No, I don't think I've ever, ever heard of it. I've heard about enzyme therapy. It, it goes under a variety of names, doesn't it? I've heard of digestive enzyme therapy, pancreatic, yeah. and also systemic enzyme therapy. I've got a quote by the American Cancer Society. They write, there have been no well-designed studies showing that enzyme supplements are effective in treating cancer. Experts question whether enzymes taken by mouth can reach tumors through the bloodstream as the enzymes are broken down into amino acids before being absorbed in the intestine. Oh, I have heard of this then. Yeah, it's the idea that you can take the enzymes, the digestive enzymes that your pancreas would normally produce. Um, that people, for example, for example, people with cystic fibrosis will take them because their pancreas doesn't work as well to help digestion. And somehow it's going to those digestive enzymes was as opposed to get into the blood, which doesn't make a whole lot of sense because they have evolved to stay inside your gut. They're not supposed to go out to go into your blood. They're supposed to be in your gut and digest. There's no reason for them to go in into your blood. Yeah, there's no mechanism whereby. They can even do that. A different study found that they studied 55 patients who had inoperable pancreatic cancer. 23 chose chemotherapy and the rest chose the proteolytic enzyme therapy. The 23 who chose chemotherapy survived 14 months or three times longer than the group who chose the alternative treatment. They survived 4.3 months and plus the group that chose chemotherapy had better quality of life than those who chose the alternative protocol. So I see out of all the alternative cancer treatments, are there, has there ever been any single one which has been shown to have any benefit of any kind? Apart from maybe at a therapeutic level, I can understand some of them might reduce someone's stress, but have any of them been shown to have any kind of value whatsoever, even in the slightest degree? Well, if it did, it would be medicine, the alternative medicine. I'm trying to think of, of you see, I can think of any cancer treatments that used to be considered alternative medicine, but isn't anymore, but I can't. Yeah, like I say, that's the only real benefit I can see from some of them, that they just might help calm someone down or make them relax a little bit and reduce their stress. But beyond that, I cannot think of how any of them would actually work. Well, I had acupuncture once and I don't have cancer, so I think that's definitive proof. I think the reason it's hard to come up with examples is because if any of these alternative treatments did work and were effective, it would become mainstream establishment medicine almost immediately. And so the longer these alternative cancer treatments are out there on the fringe outside the medical establishment, the more you can kind of set up a litmus for how bullshit they are. The longer they're out there, the longer they're not being accepted by the medical establishment, the more confidence you can have that they're probably not to be trusted. Does it worry, though, that more and more these sorts of therapies and these sorts of alternatives are being picked up by proponents of conspiracy theory? And so most of the time when you see this, it's all bundled in with the same sort of distrust of the authority figures, distrust of medical science, distrust of science in general, and therefore it not being proven science, it not being a medically effective tool doesn't seem to matter anymore because people don't believe the people who are actually pushing the science. Oh, it becomes a good thing. Yeah, at that point, once you believe in conspiracies, the fact that there's no evidence for the conspiracy means that turns into evidence somehow. When a study fails to find a result or whether when a particular scientist who's been like the last 20 years studying the effects of, for example, acupuncture on, on cancer, and he thinks he's found something, but the medical establishment has told him, no, this isn't true, you know, we've not been able to back it up. That actually gives it credence within those sorts of circles. Like that gives sort of Mark, Mike Adams type people and shamanic solutions type people this you world to go, well, this person's been pushed out and you should follow this. You should follow this treatment. You should follow this alternative because it's been demonized by science. I find it incredibly frustrating that when you're trying to change somebody's mind about this issue, they, with such ease, can 
dismiss what you're trying to educate them on by two words. All they have to say is big pharma and they think they're done. Your counterpoints to my arguments are coming from big pharma. They're paying you to say this. The papers you're citing are funded by big pharma. It's, it's very prevalent. Yeah, it's incredibly frustrating. And also the fact that stuff that isn't yet medicine, so stuff that hasn't actually gone through the proper procedures or is currently going through testing, um, is then legitimized regardless of whether the outcome is positive or not. I mean, there's one example is dandelion root project, using dandelion root extract, etc., to treat cancer cells. And a lot of proponents of sort of woo science uh, or woo, whatever you want to call it, have picked that up and gone the dandelion, which is a plant, is a healing plant that should be, you know, you've got it in your park, it's being suppressed, etc., etc. And yeah, it's incredibly frustrating. But it's a weed. That's why we're not suppressing it to get rid of the cancer because we've, we're trying to suppress a cancer cure. We're doing it because we don't want it in our garden. For fuck's sake. There's one guy, um, if, you go on, if you go on Facebook, you might see him. I'm not sure if his page is still up. I actually reported him to the police at one point because I got so fed up with the fact that he, he was trying to encourage people to avoid NHS uh, treatments, to avoid chemotherapy and radiotherapy in favour of what he called uh, shamanic healing processes involving DMT, cannabis, dandelion roots and uh, various different oh, non-scientific processes um, to try and a, relax people, that's fair enough, but also then feed them various different drugs and cannabis. I've forgotten exactly what it was called, but can cannabis therapy and all that kind of thing. And on his site, for example, he talks about only those suffering Stockholm syndrome and cognitive dissonance would let their loved ones die and not turn to the nature of God where our infinite light beings truly reside. The chalk of truth goes way deeper than 99% of humanity's current perception. The chalk of truth is happy to deliver the talk of truth to the collective human consciousness, while the trained shaman of, of Pashmama teach others how to gain the light of magic of extrasensory perception. Can I have some dressing with that word salad? You may indeed. <laughs> This is the kind of stuff that these a lot of proponents. This one was a particularly stark example of where trying to instill fear in people, trying to tell them that you know you have been controlled your entire life by big pharma, by science, etc., and you should come back to nature. You should allow plants to heal you. You should allow people who talk about plants in this specific way to heal you. People buy into it. People in their thousands buy into it. You go to some of these Facebook groups, they've got hundreds of thousands of people following them. And that's one of the things that really annoys me. These people who, see, who cry conspiracy, they don't seem to recognize that the doctors and their family get cancer. Researchers get cancer. People who work at pharmaceutical companies get cancer and their family get cancer. Um, they're as much invested in finding a cure as anyone. Oh, indeed. And, and one thing that I think Natural News has banded around is saying that they, they, they said 70% of oncologists said they wouldn't have radiotherapy or chemotherapy because they'd seen what it does to their patients. And I don't know whether that's true or not, but it's once again instilling this kind of fear, fear saying the people who develop these won't even use them. They just want to use them on you. It shows a real lack of empathy on the part of the conspiracy theorists to view corporations and paint them all as big pharma, even though there's not a single corporation, but they like to bunch it all together under the umbrella of big pharma, to view the people there as essentially non-human beings who don't get cancer, who are like these soulless entities who are out to make a buck from us, uh, regardless of whether they hurt or help us in any way. What what they're doing is they're alienating other people in their minds and not viewing them as human like themselves. And us versus them mentality. Yeah. If if there was a deliberate effort to hide a cancer cure, there would have been whistleblowers and it would have been on mainstream news. It would be obvious. Yeah. There's also also the fact that if one pharmaceutical company was suppressed, uh, found a, uh, a cure for, a cure for cancer, and suppressed it. The likelihood of another company then finding it and, and starting to use it and actually making money off it is still there. Yeah, because it isn't one corporation, it's several corporations that is in competition with each other. And this is where another level of conspiracy theory comes in because they talk about the patent system and they'll say, well, you'll never know because the patent could be hidden. You'll never know because we have got this massive patent system, which it would take ages to look through. And we haven't found it yet, but it could be there and it could be proven. Or there'll be a patent or a patent request for a certain type of treatment that hasn't actually even been developed yet. 
which there's an idea patent on. And they'll point to that idea patent as proof that something is being suppressed. It goes the other way as well. There's a, a group who were working on uh, DSMO as a cancer cure. And they kept saying in their press releases that uh, the pharmaceutical industry won't touch them because you can't make money off DSMO because it's, uh, it's been known about for 100 years or so now. I looked into this a little bit and they actually had the patent on DSMO as a cancer therapy because you can patent novel uses of pre-existing chemicals. So just outright hypocrisy and bullshit coming from this was unbelievable. Okay, and... I'm going to go on to the final one. So the last one is sex prevents or cures cancer. Um, Jen, what do you say? That's going to be a cure. The Daily Mail is a smart mail magazine, so go for it. Julia. I agree. James. Uh, I said cure the last year. It'd be 50-50 if I say uh, it's going to be gives you cancer. And Nathan. I'm going to go with cures cancer because I think I've seen this one before, although I've not quite sure, but I'm going to go with cure. Okay, catch. Well, it has to prevent because of the connection to Mother Gaia, and yeah, it'll prevent it. I can't even keep that up. <laughs> okay, and Micro? I'm going to say cause, just out of the idea that I think the Daily Mail would love to write that story. Oh, and something you love is going to kill you. Uh, right, guys, I'm going to go away and tot up the score, so carry on the discussion. I'll be back in a minute. Does anybody have any favorite cancer cures? And by favorite, I mean, what's the craziest claims out there that you've heard? What's the craziest? I haven't heard anything that can top what we've mentioned so far. Have a yeah, think about I... something that could be brought up or could be claimed as, such as maybe planetary alignments or something like that. I don't know. Chakras? I mean, at this point, you can you can probably say anything as long as you're not saying that like obvious dangerous things. And even yeah, no, actually, even then, you could probably convince someone that it can cure cancer. If you make a claim, there will be someone out there believe that who will believe you. You can make something up yourself uh, as a complete parody and make it as crazy as you want it, and you'll find maybe later on to your dismay that somebody actually is saying this. The Dirty Laundry of George Lucas. Bungee jumping. Wait, the Dirty Laundry of George Lucas, would that be Jar Jar Binks? Oh, he definitely causes cancer. <laughs> he causes a lot of things. Rage. Okay, everyone, I've got the results here. So Ooh. I'll go from last place to first. Uh, last place, uh, Julia, sorry to say. Oh, no. Commiserations. And- it's a, it's a three-way tie for second place with Jen, Kitch, and Nathan. Woo! Oh. And yeah, Micro and James, you've both tied for first place with four. Oh! So just to go through them again, uh, dogs, they both cause and cure cancer. Ah. I'll just go to the same. <laughs> yeah, it's saying that dogs, they can give you breast cancer and they can also cut the owner's risk by a third. That's the two stories the Daily Mail have done on that. Uh, what's the mechanism for them doing so? Yeah. I don't think we really want to go into it. <laughs> Magic. Next one was electricity. That causes cancer. Ooh. And that's, uh, yeah, so the headlines were cancer risk 70% higher near power lines, power lines linked to cancer, growing evidence of power line dangers, yeah. Brilliant, even though the body is uh, bioelectrical. Fantastic. Uh, So the next one was housework that prevents cancer, and that reduces the risk of breast cancer in women. Of course it does. Shocker. Yeah, so we were right about the chauvinism. It is true, though. Come on, I haven't got breast cancer yet, and I do housework all the time. Anecdotal evidence is evidence, surely. And, yeah, masturbation prevents cancer. And you're going to love this headline from the Daily Mail. Give your health a helping hand, men. (laughs) <laughs> oh my god I actually have to credit that's a great point. <laughs> that, that, that is pretty good last credit for all, credit is due 10 points for creativity last one sex and that causes and prevents cancer so sex disease doubles risk of cancer promiscuous teenagers at risk swinging 60s leave cancer like 1 in 10 and active sex life cuts prostate cancer risk once you're over 50 so 
It's interesting in a way because uh, sex can cause cancer by transmission of HPV, because HPV is a cause of uh, cervical cancer. So that's kind of true. So sex is good for you for fighting cancer to the common cold, and it's just what the doctor orders, and it's better for men. Um, don't have sex while you have the common cold. You'll all that you will ha happen is that you will infect your your partner. And it's just not pleasant. Yeah, you don't yeah. want to be sneezing out of two places at once. Yes, snot, snot is not lube. Yeah, and having a, having a phlegmy cough while you're at it wouldn't be too attractive either. I'm at <laughs> anyway, we really are plumbing the depths. <laughs> so... <laughs> Circling the terrain. Yeah, well, I think, uh, Nathan, you can start to wrap it up there if you want. So, Micro and Jim the Evo, I think it's got to be a fight to the death to see who wins that one. Yeah, we might have to have a tiebreaker someday. Mortal Kombat. All right, well, I think we've covered quite a bit of ground. That's our show for today. We'll be recording a show next week, so it'll be out two weeks from now. And on that show, we're going to have Rowley Partinen and Vance Crow on to talk about eco-modernism. So that'll be a really fascinating show. I know Cal's really looking forward to that. Well, yeah, and we've had Rowley and Vance on before, and they're both fantastic folk, both very different personalities in their approach to things, but they're, they're both very... Uh, passionate about eco modernism, so hopefully, we learn quite a bit there. Hope you enjoyed this show. Leave your feedback if you want. Follow me on Twitter at the Natheist if you like. And I think you can find everybody else's Twitter handles in the show description. And just to say thanks to our guest, um, as you know, James, Jim, I keep flipping between Jim and James, I hope he doesn't mind, but uh. Jim had to James had to leave early, but please go to his channel, Jim the Evil, for more. So he does a lot of good stuff on diseases and that. And also do please check out the League of Nerds, a kind of fellow show of ours, very similar kind of style. But thank you. If you enjoy our show, you'll enjoy them. And a very big thank you to Microbloganism for coming along. It's been great to have you on. No, thanks for having me. It was fun. And yep, you can get to shout out your channel right now. Oh, yeah, just search for microbloganism. I'm, I should probably spell that, actually. M-I-C-R-O-B-L-O-G-G-A-N-I-S-M. Yep, and it definitely comes from in recommended. And Nathan, I'll let you close us out there. Thanks for joining me, everybody, and I hope you have a great rest of your weekend, whatever you're doing and wherever you're going. Cheers, everyone. See you guys. Bye. See you guys. Bye.